from de design. I love any time, any opportunity, um, I can to design new things. Um, so admittedly, I've been spending a lot of time during this quarantine um, with like DIY projects. I jokingly, not jokingly, want to take a carpentry class just to get into like the I can do it design mode. Do you watch a lot of HGTV? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's sickening, yes. <laughs> background noise. <laughs> Weekend <laughs> background. Yeah. Anybody else? Name where you are now? Any of the icebreakers? Sure, I can go. I'm Cindy Krucklow. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, I would think my favorite superhero. I love all of the Marvel universe. But I think since we're at a women in code, we're going to go for a strong woman and we're going to go Black Widow tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Smart and sassy. And yeah, a go getter. So awesome. Anybody else? I won't call on anybody. I can introduce myself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Shannon McGuire. I'm here in Bloomington, Indiana right now at Indiana University. Yay. Go on. And uh, my favorite superhero would be originally Spider-Man, but with the new Captain Marvel movies coming out, she stole my heart. <laughs> great movies. Great character. Shannon. For alumni. What's that? I went to IU as well. Leslie, I didn't know you went to IU. I did. Bloomington. I was once a Midwesterner. Wow. <laughs> you know I'm from Indiana. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Well, I learned. I didn't know that either. <laughs> yes, I am from Indianapolis. And um, oh, my wow. parents, my parents actually went to IU. Nice. So nice. I had spent a lot of time there. <laughs> When we immigrated from Africa to America, we immigrated to Indianapolis, and my dad actually taught at the IU Med Center. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. How long did you live in Indianapolis? Uh, two years, and then I went to Purdue, and then after mm -hmm. that, you know, I was where my job was, <laughs> which was Florida and the Chicago area. Wow. And a lot of Midwesterners. Yeah. But, but Indianapolis now is a great city. It's really a great city. It is. It is. If I hadn't spent my entire life there, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I would have um, gone back at, at some point, but I was, you know, <laughs> after like 20 years, I was done. <laughs> Anybody else would like to do an introduction? We still have a couple minutes left. I guess I can finish my introduction. Oh, now. sure, yes. Starting on the uh, IUB story. But yes, I'm. Uh, my name is Leslie, and um, I am actually based out of Seattle. So I'm just here as a guest for the Women Who Code uh, Chicago chapter. And uh, let's see. My superhero. I, let, let me let me change that topic to what I, what are some fun things I did from my, during my COVID. I started <gasps> planting avocado plant. So, the ones that you eat and buy from the store, I peel the skin off and then I planted water based. And uh, I have out of avocado plant uh, with a growing light on top that I turn it on all all day long. And it's oh my gosh, so maybe a. Uh, yeah, it's pretty tall right now. It has like 20 leaves on it, but I so think you're I know right. six to 10 years to get to get the real avocado. <gasps> so, you're a unicorn. I'm, I'm like, I don't think I've ever heard anybody actually say that they've successfully planted an avocado. It's all about the experience. <laughs> I, I have tried that as well. I mean, so I think I've tried like every single hack. Like I do the pineapple thing where you like cut off the top of the pineapple and you put it in water. And I did the avocado, like you put the toothpicks in it and then you put it in, in like a dish of water or whatever. But I never got it as far as, as you have. So that's impressive. <laughs> do any of you try uh, propagating succulents? I do that and they... They, it's amazing. They easily propagate. I did. 
No, yeah. but next time I see you in real life, um, <laughs> would love bring to. you some. <laughs> yes. And another thing I did was um, when I was in um, I, I was in Richmond, Virginia. I saw people, uh, a person planting a succulent in a uh, a beer can that had the label removed, so it was just silver. So I've done that too. So you can use a can opener, take the lid off, put soil in, put a succulent in, and it looks really modern. Wow, I'm learning all sorts of stuff. <laughs> I started gardening as well, but I actually got a um, like a garden system. It's the mm. G I R D Y N, and so you put these seed pods into. It's like a, a hydroponic system, and so um, and it it controls the lighting and the water and all of that for you. So it's it's you know like you can have a black thumb. And, and grow something, but we always have, you know, fresh um, vegetables growing in, in our living room, because that was really the only place to put it, but it was, it's been my quarantine hobby. Yeah. Has anyone ever had success with those tomato planters that hang upside down? Because I had one of those and I could never get it to go. I was, it looked I, so cool, but... I bought one from an infomercial and um, I live in the city. So I'm, I'm in Chicago and um, the, I don't like rats or squirrels or whatever little critters um, got them. So I like to think that if not for those critters, I would be a uh, tomato farmer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, Karen McDonald. I am going to make you a co-host. Sorry, I was on mute. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everybody tonight. I got to figure out how to get the cool women who coach Chicago background. <laughs> Um, it, it took me a while to get my background <laughs> facing the right direction. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. Um, it is five o'clock central time. And um, just a, a couple of notes. Um, we are recording tonight's events and um, we are planning to take screenshots for social media. So if you would like to remain anonymous, just use your first name and keep your video off. Um, you know, we just spent a little bit of time doing the icebreaker. You know, this is actually our first um, uh, digital event. And so typically, um, if you come to one of our in person events, we will have a networking uh, cocktail hour. And it's a lot of fun where you'll get to meet various women who code members in, in real life. Um, but until we resume that time again, we will enjoy our, uh, our fun little uh, icebreakers and get to know each other. All right. So This is, like I had mentioned, our first Women Who Code digital event for uh, 2021. We are kicking it off with a discussion on master data management. So we have a panel of three experts from different industries who have really experienced the MDM journey from different perspectives. Um, I'm gonna go through the agenda and do a little bit of housekeeping first. So this will just take a few minutes. Um, we will do a welcome from Women Who Code, followed by the panel discussion. And we will also uh, reserve some time at the end for Q&A. We do want this to be interactive, so please feel free to uh, use the chat function or raise your hand if you have any questions. We do have moderators that are in the audience who will be monitoring the chat, but also feel free to, to jump in with any questions um, as, as you have them. But you know, just typical online event best practices, which I'm sure that everybody is aware of by now, just mute yourself when you aren't talking. And if you feel comfortable, turn on your video. And um, you know, I would I would be remiss if I didn't put a plug in for our next event, which is on March 8th at 5 p.m. Central Time. 
we are going to be celebrating International Women's Day with five incredible women in technology and business. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, you know, I invite you to RSVP via our meetup page um, and uh, we hope to see you there. All right, so a little bit on Women Who Code. We are a not-for-profit founded in 2011 with the vision of creating a world where women are representative as tech executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. And so this is why our mission is to inspire women in technology careers. Our chapters are completely volunteer driven and they exist in over 20 countries, 70 cities, and we really, we continue to grow. So to find the chapter nearest you, if you aren't local to Chicago, um, visit Women Who Code for slash networks. And since we are in, uh, you know, quarantine times right now, uh, all of our events are digital. So if you'd like to join uh, events across different networks, you can visit womenwhocode.com forward slash digital. That'll give you all of the events that Women Who Code put on across the globe. And um, for those of you who have been to our events before, you've seen the code of conduct we presented at the start of every event. I will briefly summarize it here that Women Who Code is an inclusive community. We're dedicated to providing an empowering experience for everyone who participates in or supports our community. Our, in, our events are intended to inspire women to excel in technology careers and anyone who is here for that purpose is always welcome. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the women who are bringing you this event for tonight. Our Women Who Code directors, we have Ann Young, Blanca Roman, Karen McDonald, Sungmi Naylor, and myself, I'm your MC for tonight's event. My name is Andrea Chang. And of course, our three panelists who are data experts from various industries. I cannot wait to hear from these ladies. First, we have Cindy Krecklow, who is an experienced data engineer and leader. She is currently working in the financial services industry at Northwestern Mutual, leading improvements in their client data space to power experiences for NM's clients and field force. When she's not pursuing her passion in the data space, she enjoys being outside, enjoying the beautiful four seasons that Wisconsin provides with her family and friends. Next, we have Leslie Lynn, who is a consultant at Slalom Consulting, where she focuses on transforming clients' businesses through cloud and system integration. Her work speeds up information flows, ensures business-to-business -business communication, and reduces operational costs for an organization. She also has passion to ensure the uniformity, accuracy, and stewardship through master data management. And finally, we have Karen Nicopoulos, who is the Director of Master Data Management and Governance at Zebra Technologies in Lincolnshire. She's responsible for customer, item, and supplier across the company. Karen is passionate about continually improving data management and engaging leaders across the company around all things data. Karen has a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Engineering from Purdue University and lives in Crystal Lake, Illinois with her husband, Tom, and has two grown daughters. So with that, I will open up the panel discussion. So the first question um, I am going to throw over uh, to Karen. Um, for those who are new to master data management or have really kind of heard the term bantered about, um, what, what is MDM and why do we even need it? Okay, so first, just to ground everyone, master data is typically the concise and uh, uniform data set that is used to run companies. So things like that describe things like customers, items, suppliers, for example. And master data management um, is really the management of the data from creation through disposition. And it's done through the application of governance um, through processes, policies, procedures, metrics, tools, to make sure that you establish that data set as a corporate asset. So why is it important? Um, it's really important to provide clear definition 
make sure you have clear ownership of data sets, um, have tools and processes in place. And that's to make sure that you have better, leaner, cleaner data, which enables better analytics for the company, enables better decision, business decision-making, and then of course, operational efficiencies. Fantastic. So Cindy, you are a data integration engineer. Um, at what point did Northwestern Mutual realize the need for a master data management solution and, and where are you on your journey? Sure, that answer gets a little complicated. So I think in some <laughs> ways um, we knew a long time ago, maybe tw 20 or more years, um, you know, NM, or Northwestern Mutual in the financial service industry has a broad range of product offerings from life insurance to investment products, disability insurance. So um, being, I guess, a long lived company, a lot of our company was focused on products. And um, one of our biggest pain points throughout history has been like trying to change from a product oriented to a client oriented company. And um, you know, 20 years ago is when that need started to surface more and more every day that we had to start shifting our experiences and be able to look at the entire client to enable a lot of experiences, both for those clients and the field reps. Um, then over the last, I guess, five years or so, that's really exploded because the expectations of the people interacting with us are just going higher and higher and higher. The experiences we're expected to deliver are becoming more mature, more sophisticated, more feature rich, and our data was not keeping up, um, you know, from missing attributes to misdefined attributes to even non-functionals like you know, how fast are we able to make the data available to consumers? Is it stable enough? Um, so all of those kind of technical foundations were failing us. So at that point, we realized, like, in order for us to keep up with the experiences we have to deliver, we need to start making a much greater investment in things. So which brings us to today, um, I guess we've had some missteps over the last few years, but I think right now we're on a path um, finally excited that we're getting um, a data governance setup started. <laughs> um, I think it got its feet off the ground last year. Um, we're going to start that to kind of learn the principles, set up the people, the process um, through our client data to kind of avoid boiling the ocean out of, you know, out of the gate. Um, we're also looking at more um, master data management solutions to help us bring that client data together and provide the best view to our business. Um, but as we do those things, we're also looking at tactical business improvements every day um, because the problems are now. So as we work through strategic stuff, we're also looking at how do we ease the, the pains that everyone is feeling. So that's a little bit taste of where we're at right now. Yeah, and, and probably a familiar story to, to a lot of people <laughs> um, on this webinar as well. Um, you know, what you, you mentioned governance, and I want to come back to that because um, I think that that's um, such an important topic. Um, but I wanted to flip over to Leslie because, Leslie, I know that um, you're in the midst of an MDM engagement right now. Um, with a client and you know we'll we'll keep we'll keep client name confidential and everything but you know as much as you can um, you know talk about the engagement like what what brought this about and really you know what what was the client's need? Sure happy to uh, share a bit more so we are seeing a lot of um, new MDM requests or engagement coming up and seems like it's becoming more of a hot topic. So this, um, for example, this recent uh, client I'm working on, they did have some forms of MDM um, practice in place, but oftentimes you can find the MDM uh, solution to be over complex. Uh, it's not a feeded solution. And oftentimes it's not just about data, but about people. Um, and about the teams that you're working with. So for example, trying to get the whole data governance console aligned on a specific solution and how do we get there? 
um, that's that's number one. Um, but also, oftentimes, we're also seeing migration from one platform to another in order to meet that uh, MDM solution. So, for example, in this case, it could be from Informatica to Boomi. You know, comparison of different tools. Uh, and the cost savings. Uh, so that's how we landed in this engagement, for example. And then past, we also had uh, work involving cleaning up MDM, um, you know, uh, or putting in place a data storeship um, guidance. Um, so these are what we're seeing current um, as growing demand in a lot of organizations. Um, yeah, so hopefully that covers yeah, and and you know, I I know that you're you're just in the midst of the engagement, and you've been there for a, a few months now. But um, and and typically when we kind of look at you know MDM and an MDM journey, we think it's you know like a, a really long time. But what are some of the immediate benefits that your client is seeing? Yeah, I think um, from a consulting perspective, a lot of times we come in and look at things from a different lens. Uh, we think about best practices. And when you think of MDM, it's not only just about data. For example, where is this getting hosted? What kind of infrastructures in the background? Um, developers who are developing those process uh, related to MDM, are, are they um, you know, abiding to the best practices? So some of the immediate benefits we're seeing even just by talking to the clients, for example, you know, have we considered um, certain infrastructure environment to be set up uh, in order to meet, for example, queuing service or um, UAT testing, or you know, have we thought about disaster recovery after prod go live? And then from a development perspective, can we make some of the process more reusable so that can speed up the MDM uh, life cycle? So those are all the things that we ask and you know, um, trying to offer the best practices on. And uh, we're seeing you know, e even immediate benefits around that, even just during you know, um, discovery or implementation phase. Great. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna like bring it all the way back to, to the beginning. So for those who are just getting started um, on their MDM journey, you know, really what, what's the best way to get buy-in from executive leadership and how, how do you start to set expectations around the business value and, and really start to define that ROI? And I can throw that out to, um, you know, Karen and would love to hear from, from Cindy as well. Cindy, you, you want to go first? <laughs> Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so 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 at 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 Zebra where I am, uh, data is managed. Uh, I'm responsible for customer, supplier, and item in a variety of different places. So I'm going to just talk about customer first. And today, the way our business is, we don't have a central MDM customer master tool, right? So um, our data is mastered. Uh, predominantly in one tool for the financial aspects, but then in other tools for other aspects around customer, things that help us sell to market from a customer relationship management. So in terms of like, if you need anything done in master data to make improvements, but the hardest part is, is that trying to justify a tool in a vacuum as a master data implementation is very challenging. So the way you have to do it is you have to have master data as a part of another project. Because if you speak to various different consulting organizations, they will tell you that the success of the project is very much dependent on the data. So if you've said the ROI for implementing this new supply chain planning tool, for example, is this, it will not realize that if you don't have good quality data. So, so basically, you know, that is one of the key areas that you have to look at. Um, another thing is, is that, you know, you, at my company, what I've done is put a framework in place that really engages projects to assess their data needs and does it impact master data at the time that they're doing the project itself. So for example, if you're going to touch master data, like a, the customer master, and you have a failing area in that area, then 
then it's at that time that you can use that. You're effectively opening the patient to go in and bring other master data sort of governance through tools, um, raise the level of that. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered the question for you. It has to be within other projects, not as a standalone, it's challenging. Yeah, I can add to those thoughts. I mean, I think um, we're going through this right now to get the support that we need to make the improvements in the entire life cycle. And I think one thing that we've done is obviously make sure that we have broad stakeholder support. Um, one thing that's been interesting learning about more of the space, um, just the complexity and the number of impacts that it has. And if you pull this lever that so I think having like the business involved, technology, law, your compliance people, what are you doing? Where are you pulling the levers to improve things is important. Um, I think me being a technologist, I have to remember to speak in business language and business value terms. Um, some of the things that we do to solve these problems are technical. So it's hard, you know, you're trying to make a technical investment to help. Um, but you have to remember to speak and how are these things impacting the outcomes for the business. And what we did was we ended up, I guess, making it real by having a lot of real examples of feedback that we were getting um, and the pain points that were being felt um, in our experiences to help make it more real for those that were looking at our business case for this. Um, it just brought it to life, which I think otherwise it wouldn't have been. Um, you know, I think the other thing that I've tried to remember is just to be very transparent. Um, yeah, that in our world, I would say our client master data is rich with opportunity. So if I do one thing, um, it wasn't going to be a silver bullet that all of a sudden everything was going to get resolved. So knowing, trying to make sure that leadership knows that it's, we're in it for a long haul. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Like there is no magic easy button that's gonna solve it all. So kind of making sure that people are there with you till the end um, because it is a huge undertaking like from creation to retention to data quality, um, just everything that has to get done. So um, I think the only last point I would say is just making sure you have also support from multiple levels in the organization because it impacts everyone a little bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wrote down rich with opportunity because I am going to um, use that. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, just to, to kind of tag on to that too, um, Cindy, so I, I mean, I'm interested in like, what's the level of, of business collaboration? Like who, who owns it? Is it tech ownership? Is it business ownership? Or is it a shared model that you're using? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's probably both. Um, at our org, we also have a strong digital prod product org that I guess helps build the bridges between the two sides and make sure that we're working and communicating together. Mm -hmm. So I can add from our side, um, uh, we state that the business owns the data. Right. So we put a lot of ownership on the business and what we have done is put metrics in place. Um, so my team develops metrics that measure the quality of the data. So we view metrics as a key aspect of governance. Right. So if you cannot ensure quality data at entry, for example, um, then you need to have a metrics to monitor it. And we align those metrics to, to the organization creating the failure. And then we hold them accountable for doing the root cause and helping us come up with the solutions. And in some cases it could be training. And in other cases, building on what Sydney had said, it continues to share the pain points that the, the business, uh, you cannot rely on the users to follow process or be trained to enter the data correctly. We really need to look at tools to enable that. So what we've come up with in our organization, for example, when you're entering addresses, you know, we have a, we, we've reached out to use a tool, Google Places, right? And we now have Google Places at most entry points in the organization. That is an app 
um, that you, an API, sorry, that um, auto populates an address as you type it in. So we're trying to implement technologies at entry points as well as metrics. So we're hitting it sort of from both ends in terms of, of quality. And what I will say to you is that in the various areas, we have seen significant improvement in quality just by measuring it, right? You know, and prioritizing what needs to be fixed. So going back to Cindy, don't boil the ocean, right? I mean, if you need to look at your customer master and you have duplicates, you know, you, you prioritize your top enterprise customers and you make sure they're clean first before you look at going down to lower levels. So lots of layers of what one can do. And this is how you get uh, leadership involved from our perspective, because when they see the impact and then I can actually align it, by the way, if you fix this, it saves this amount of effort on the cleansing side. It really helps with driving, um, you know, driving improvements and buy into projects. Yeah. And so since you, you brought up tools and I know that tools are, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hot topic, right? Um, and there is a question um, from Anne-Marie at, at Kellogg's. Um, have you incorporated a, a, a data dictionary? Oh, yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> data dictionary is part of the governance process. And, you know, we have every attribute that we can documented and our data dictionary is very expansive in terms of, um, and this is clearly a part of the governance, right? Like what's the definition? So if you have a field or like a, for example, customer and how customer is going to set up, you have to have cross the organization functionally, like all functions agreeing and stacking hands that, yep, this is the definition of what a customer is. So we use the data dictionary also for attributes. We define who the owner of the field is, which may be different from the data enterer. And the owner is who we reach out to if there are quality issues so that they actually work with the data enterer as it's their responsibility to make sure data is entered correctly but we, we use data dictionaries heavily at our company. I don't, we don't use a tool today, we're investigating tools, but we have um, a rich um, Excel that we use today that shows all the downstream um, transactions using the data. So if we need to make a change, we know who to reach out to, to alert them that the change is coming or to get their buy-in if it's a cross-functional need for change. May I add on to something uh, to what Karen just said? Absolutely. But, yeah, so besides data dictionary, I mean, every entity does things differently. Um, so I've been seeing, you know, maybe a hybrid model between business and the tech team. Um, I've been seeing that business is the owner of the data, that they, they're the ones that making decisions. Uh, I, I've also been seeing that some organizations just want to keep it in-house with the tech team and let them be the part-time data stewards. Um, so I think every organization does things differently, but from a tools perspective, something to consider, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at the data model, when designing MVM, um, is we want to have the data model designed and discussed early on and involving the right folks to make sure that this MVM model is considering all of the um, target systems or um, source systems that are in place. So for example, if it's um, HR related system, then you want to talk to the right people there as early on as possible. Um, so that's one for data model and data dictionary. Karen has already covered that. Um, and sometimes mapping documents uh, is also a great asset and to, to maintain and make sure they're accurate and um, updated. So, so that uh, whatever is in the edge systems are getting captured correctly in your MDM um, tools. So, so my two cents. Yeah, and, and that is, so in some aspects, um, we do need IT's help in some of the areas. The, the idea is we're trying to encourage the business to own their mistakes, because <laughs> that's, uh, that's key to them. Um, preventing future mistakes. Right. For sure. Amber, did that, did they answer your question? 
Good. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sure the tools topic will, will come up again, but I did want to make sure that we talked um, about data governance and the governance board. And, um, you know, Karen, I know you lead the governance board at, um, at Zebra. Um, so does governance need to be fully mature before implementing MDM? That's a good question. And the answer to that is definitely not. <laughs> so it's we started- It's probably a relief to it, a lot of yeah. people. <laughs> In fact, it, it, it's, it, it isn't, you know, and, you know, um, uh, Cindy and Leslie both just touched on this. You definitely need senior leadership um, and engagement on the need for data governance. So on my governance board, I have several VPs that sit on the governance board. Um, then I also have to read out regularly to the CFO um, on what's on the state of the quality of the data. But we started our journey, we had had a consulting company come in and assess the quality of our data. And they had said that we were in some areas rather reactive, right? And so I think uh, uh, Cindy might have refer referred to that earlier <laughs> in her journey and discussion, right? And so, you know, what we did was we, we came up with a list of areas that we needed to address. So um, at, at Zebra, they had acquired Motorola Enterprise. So we were trying to merge two companies with very different business processes um, together and, the result of during that, um, we realized that one company did things one way, the other company another, and we needed this level of quality and that's where we put these metrics in place. So we started slowly with a few areas and from that we learned sort of almost like building blocks, right? So that, oh, this is what works and then you can take, now you need to look at another data element. So rolling out monitoring and um, analysis on that next data element was much simpler. Um, it could, in, in, we are now down to the point where we might identify quality or, or decide we want to check in one specific area or an item and we can get it rolled out with significant quality improvements within two months. So that's key. The process, you can start with not very mature processes at all and grow through this. So we're about three years into the journey of the governance board. And the board evolves, right? Over time, it changes who needs to participate and, and what decisions are being handled at that level. And Cindy, um, from you know your perspective at uh, Northwestern Mutual, um, how, how was the, um, like kind of what was the genesis of the, the data governance board and, and how did that um, evolve through your um, MDM? implementation? Yeah, I think actually in my case, they've evolved somewhat separately, but aware of each other. I think mm -hmm. obviously we're in a very heavily regulated environment and um, I think trying to get better control about, you know, what all data do we have? Who's using it? Where is it going? And that I think was, I guess, one of the big reasons to you know, to stand up governance and start understanding that better and feel, you know, good about what we have and are we using it to our advantage and are we keeping it all safe? So, um, and also I think just focusing on the client and notice, knowing that we're having a lot of pain points around enabling what we want to do because of that. And um, somewhat being in the data integration space, I think sometimes we feel like we're trying to be superheroes to try to fix what's being given to us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, like Karen is saying, moving that quality to the front is also another huge reason so that we're being more proactive about just about everything <laughs> where right now we really are very reactive. Yep. And um, a question um, from from the audience: How do you how do you handle new projects? So, is there a gating process to go through the data governance board for approval? And then um, I think that there's also a, a separate question that I'll ask around like the project close and how that works. So, I'll just I'll, I'll first throw out the um, initial question about new projects. So, how how does that uh, work with the data data governance board? 
So I can take that one from my company. So last year I implemented a framework and basically following um, like a project life cycle. And so we've developed a series of questions up front where the project needs to um, answer those questions. Those questions are designed to help them ferret out if the project impacts master data. Is there a certain quality level that's needed um, in order for them to appropriately plan? You know, so at the sort of like the um, the scope and prior to getting ROI phase, right? Like doing the ROI, we have them do this. And one of the key um, questions that uh, so we, we're doing this and, and part of it is as a result of the, the, the prior thought process was, well, master data, it's little, we won't really worry too much about it and maybe we'll fix things after we've gone live with tickets that come in or um, you know, uh, tickets that may occur. And what we've discovered is that in some projects we had key misses. So I'm gonna use an example. We implemented a tool that required address quality to be geocode locatable. Well, that project never checked, are the processes capturing addresses geocode locatable? And the answer was no. So when the project went live, you know, uh, the capability was delivered, right? So IT delivered the capability and check, you know, that their work is done. Um, however, the business couldn't use the tool because for several months until we got the level of the dress entry up to a quality level that is geocode locatable, just as an example. So we do it with questions up front and then um, different toll gates throughout the project, you know, I'm invited to, and basically the projects, uh, we look at the cross-functional impacts up front, and then we make sure that data dictionaries are submitted. In our system, in our um, world, the data dictionary really is a process, right? You have to, to identify the downstream implications, the data enter, how it's configured. So, that for us is key at making sure that these are captured throughout the project. Fantastic. Um, so kind of as a follow up to that. So after, um, after the project ends, um, how have, how have, you know, any of you really established ongoing um, sustainment and ownership? of the data. So is there a um, like a standard RACI chart with the data? Yeah, so in data in, in my organization under the framework, you know, I have a RACI chart and it clearly explains what data owners are responsible for, um, what IT is responsible for, what data governance is responsible for, etc. Um, throughout the process and after go live. So, you know, when you exit the project, if you're able to get quality data at entry, that's amazing. Nothing else needs to happen. <laughs> but if you're not, then you need to have the appropriate monitoring in place, right? And then, you know, that then comes in with those metrics. You're looking at the metrics that align to where the failures are occurring and then you can root cause it. Is it a system integration issue? Is it, uh, hey, this, this is failing, so we really need to revisit a better way to make sure the data doesn't get entered poorly, like with addresses, for example. Leslie, what types of metrics have you um, implemented uh, for your clients or, or suggested? Are we talking about the aftermath? That, I like <laughs> the way you put it, but yes. <laughs> um, so oftentimes we try to come up with a, a customized you know, recommendation to the client, but some of the um, things that we suggest them to manage, for example, um, there, there are a few, few areas to consider. One, uh, data quality, um, right? There's metadata management as well. And then like Karen mentioned, it could be a system integration um, issue that we need to be looking at. Um, and then also uh, from a stakeholder management, uh, how we communicate the uh, errors or changes that are coming up. So, um, 
so yeah, some, it, it really depends on an organization themselves, but uh, you know, there are other criteria we're looking at, for example, is it data load successful, error management, or um, like Karen mentioned, we wanna have a predefined set of rules to decide um, the escalation route, um, who to talk to next. So these are some things we would suggest um, or recommend based on um, the structure of a certain client. Uh, yeah, even after the go live. Great. Um, we got um, a couple of questions that, you know, I, I'd love to um, open up to the entire group, but um, one, one question. So, um, Karen, um, we were a fly on the wall in your governance board meetings. Um, what types of um, decisions and what kinds of things are being discussed? This came from Cindy. So um, we, we, we state we actually state we provide status and then we have the data owners present on what they're doing so if we need to have funding it might be um, help getting funding um, in terms of decisions um, it typically the governance board because it's at a very high level we tend to maybe take certain decisions offline because they may be too detailed for like the extended audience um, what's coming up in our area is as as our company embarks on the journey of of moving our enterprise software to the cloud you know our order management software to the cloud we have a, a lot of what we refer to as key design decisions and those are design decisions that are going to impact the future of how data is used for transactions analytics um, as I mentioned earlier. And so we'll be bringing some of those decisions um, to the governance board and then prioritization of where to work. You know, if you have a lot of fail, like a lot of areas where there's a problem, you know, what should we focus on? What's causing the most pain for downstream systems? And, um, and another question that came in from from Natalie, and you know, I, I would you know encourage anybody um, out there to to jump in if you have any experience. But um, any experiences on how to handle uh, data quality when dealing with vendors? Vendors meaning like suppliers that you purchase from. I mean, I'm sorry, I, or software tools that you're buying, you're buying a tool. I'm not sure, clarifying the question. Natalie, are you out there? I am. Um, okay. Yeah, just any any sort of exchange of data with a vendor or a third party where you're getting data from them or they're getting data from you. It's in a different format. Okay. Um, how you keep it, the integrity there. Um, I'll let someone else answer before I answer. <laughs> So are you thinking some of the third party systems that we're talking about? Like, let's say um, some of the common edge system like NetSuite, Salesforce, uh, are you talking about those? Or are you thinking about more? I would say more, niche, more niche industries, you know, like a, a third party, or you think about like carrier data or vendor data where you're just sending data to them, it's being manipulated and sent back or used in some sort of way um not necessarily the privacy issue but just the data integrity itself um. yeah i mean that's it's a tough one i know that I'm, I'm sure contractually you can agree to certain things with the vendor of certain rights to see that um, i know we've done things where we request i guess regular what i'm going to call dumps of our data to come back to see, I guess, what's being held there so that we know, is it up to the quality standard that we would want? And is it matching, I guess, what we would call like the core data set that we have? But I think those are all things that have to be worked out with the vendor. Um, I know like five to 10 years ago, we struggled a lot. Anytime we sent our data to a vendor, it was like dead and gone and it was really hard to get out 
at least the full picture, but I think most vendors have come away there that they're making it more accessible again to get it back out. Just a few ideas. So, so I took that question differently and maybe the, the interpretation is a little different. I mean, if you're meaning, how do we make sure we get the correct banking details for a supplier? Is that the question or is it, you know, um, we syndicate information, like we have a tool where we syndicate some of our product information to make sure that, um, um, you know, we have, a dist we have distributors that sell our product to make sure that they have the correct specs for the product. I wasn't really sure where you were going with that, whether it's that I think it'd or- be Closer to the latter. Okay. You know, where they're using some form of our data, we need to be giving them the whole picture, that sort okay. of thing. Things get lost or not lost, but you know, it's just, it's not translating A to, to, B. A to B. Yeah. So, so, and I'm not an expert in this area particularly yet, but you know, we are deploying tools, um, syndication tools, um, and I'm not sure the name of the tool, to be honest, um, at the moment, but I can get that for you, where what, what we're having to do on our end is make sure the information in our tool is right, and they have to consume what we send them, right? So if we make changes, because obviously, you know, we may want to update something for some reason, right? So they would have to consume what we are do what we are updating. The other thing is the um, uh, the, the photographs of our product, right? That's another thing we want to make sure they're using the right photograph next to the item, for example. So we're using syndication tools and we're early in that journey. We're continuing to develop that area. Yeah, Natalie, it sounds like um, integration, system integration or data integration uh, is also might be beneficial for um, you to connect with the data uh, to uh, to help the vendor to get the right data. Um, I, I don't know, it might be relevant, but one of my past clients is in healthcare and they had third-party vendor doing benefit ver verification systems, which um, consumes very different data than what they sent. So what they did, um, you know, invited us in was to do uh, system integration, data integration using Dublumi. So you would do a lot of transformation in the background to make sure the data that we sent is meeting the requirement that they need to consume and vice versa, understanding the vendor who's doing the benefit verification and then make sure that the data that they sent back is getting transformed in a way that you know, the client wanted to consume. So I would also Great. look into those tools. Perfect, thank you. Um, so here's the question that came in around uh, regulations. So have regulations like CCPA, GDPR accelerated the MDM solution development and maturation of governance bodies? Yes. Uh oh, did I freeze? What's that? Oh, I think she, I think she did. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I would say that, yes, we do consider that, um, you know, in terms of um, security for uh, GDPR, for example, um, that that is definitely considered um, in the journey. But in terms of, uh, you know, um, so we're, that, that's helped. I know we're looking at security tools that will, will be used in the future as well. I have seen some, I can't speak to all um, based on the limited uh, use cases I have around CCPA and GDPR, but um, for example, this current client that I'm on, they have international members or branches across the globe and they had, they themselves has their client that's over 10,000 count. So, um, and some of them are in EMEA, some of them are in, you know, um, Europe region, like Eastern Asian area, and some of them are in the U.S. So when they're dealing with their data, they definitely have to consider uh, GDPR and CCPA in California regions. So 
it definitely leads to more discussion um, during their data council or data governance meetings. Um, so I would expect, I can't speak to all, but I would expect that does lead to maturation, maturation of uh, those governance bodies. I mean, in, in our space too, on the contacts, we've now added extra information that we capture around the context so that we know how to use the data. Like if the person comes from different countries, et cetera, then we know how we can share their data or how we can use it in our marketing, for example, or, you know, cause you have to gain consent to, to send them information in certain areas. So it's definitely captured and discussed in those forums. All right, here is a, a great question that I'm sure that we can all uh, relate to <laughs> from Emory. How, how have you tackled the ever elusive business teams that still insist in bypassing systems and loading data straight into the data lakes? So what types of approaches um, have, have you used um, that will educate and change such behaviors? I love that question. <laughs> okay, you want me to take that one? <laughs> so at sure. our company, we have like a, a, we've got the senior leadership team is now reporting out of a specific tool. So the data goes into that tool and that's the tool that is being reported out of. It's taken a while to get everyone there. So, you know, so because we were having the issue with apples and oranges, you're looking at this data, we're looking at this data, it's not tying. So I think the way to do it is that you have to have leadership wanting the data coming out of an analytical tool. We use Power BI, for example. So, you know, if it's not, a, not in Power BI and it's not coming, we actually have like a data factory that is a governed data factory that the data goes into and goes into the various different Power BI tools. So that's how we're doing it. Leadership is acknowledging the, the benefits of having every all the data together. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the areas that our data governance, which is still immature, is really trying to wrangle of how do you control what I'm gonna call data sprawl in general? Like how do we stop people from putting data everywhere? And you know, I think one of the things that's helped us in the past is um, things like CCPA actually kind of help because when, you, when people want to own and manage their own data, then they're also accountable for adhering to those processes, which makes it a lot less fun. So it's nicer to go use data in a controlled fashion so that you don't have to worry about those things. And just to add, it's to, it's a journey. I mean, we're still fairly early on and having them use this, um, you know, corporate data set, but um, it, it's taken uh, three years for us to get to where we are today. So it does take a while. It's not something that just happens. Yes, yeah, I know that the, uh, Anne Marie had mentioned the uh, source of truth battle, and I know that that's a, a battle that many of us face mm -hmm. <laughs> too. Yeah. Maybe I can add on more um, just by using a tool as an example, because um, uh, I'm closest to um, Boomi MDH, Master Data Hub. So where you host golden records and consuming source systems from consuming data from source systems. So establishing what is the match rule, uh, what is a certain quality that you want to achieve with those match rules. Um, how do you merge duplicated data um, or um, once the data is in quarantine, meaning that they need to be looked at by uh, some professionals such as data stewards, then I establish a guideline of on, on when and how, when the data stewards will come in to look at those quarantine records and then what set of guideline they need to follow. So um, having an MDM tool in place sometimes helps a lot. Um, some of the organizations do just to have a DB, uh, you know, a DB2 database in place too, that, that's also working, but then uh, depends on the needs. Some sometimes you, you have to 
is, you know, build additional integration process to consume those data or, um, or queuing systems, et cetera. So yeah, um, back to my point, having a centralized place for a golden record um, and tools such as Boomi that we're using right now um, could be a good solution as well. Good. Any other questions out there from, from the audience? We've got about four minutes. And then we will be um, posting this presentation on our Women Who Code YouTube channel, and I will post that link on the message board so you can refer back to it if there's something that you wanted to re-listen to. Um, and so I just wanted to, um, you know, ask one final question of, of the panelists. And, and that's like, you know, really, if you were to leave us with one piece of advice or one um, best lesson learned that, um, you know, we should take with us, what would that be? And I'll start, I'll start with Cindy. Sure, I think my biggest lesson, well, one thing that I would just focus on is just making incremental improvement. Um, start with something, start getting better. Um, I think like operating from behind is very hard and it's very hard to correct problems once they're really embedded both organizationally and in your data. So the sooner you can make progress, the better. Start small, start with something. Great advice. Start small. All right. Leslie? Understanding it's going to be a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> Set bottom line expectations and don't get upset. Yes. And yes. if the scope is large or if you want intent for a bigger scope, always get buy in from leadership and help them understand uh, and align with the mission. Yep. Absolutely. And Karen? I think it goes back to um, the, the putting the framework in place and making sure that you try to get projects to consider master data at the when they're building the business case so that, you know, people are aware so you don't get to the end. Like I had shared that one example where you can't use, <laughs> use the information. Um, and definitely it's a journey. I mean, it takes it, you've got a, you know, little wins, celebrate the wins, um, make sure that you reinforce the people that help you, you know, like that are helping with data. That's really important. So. Absolutely. It is a journey and that is hence the title. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, this is a lot of fun. I'd like to thank all of the panelists. I'd like to thank Women Who Code Chicago and all of you for, for attending. Um, we have many other events planned for the rest of the year. And one day we will be back in person again. So, you know, look forward to seeing all of you in real life. And um, if you can, please, uh, please attend our, our next event. It is March 8th for International Women's Day. So thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having, Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. You for having me.